Good evening. I'm Masume Farhat, Chief Curator and the Ibrahimi Family Curator for Persian, Arab and Turkish Art at the Freya Gallery of Art and the Arthur M. Sackler Gallery, which together form the National Museum of Asian Art. I'm delighted to welcome you to our workshop this evening called Spirituality and the Art Museum in Contemporary America. It is one of the series that the Freya Sackler um, has been organizing thanks to a generous grant from the Lilly Foundation's Religion and Cultural Institutions Initiative. This grant was designed to allow us to consider how we present and interpret religion in the museum context. Our period of collective study, roughly from April to July, coincided with the outbreak of COVID-19. The crisis, combined with our Lilly programs and conversations, have given us a renewed sense of mission that changing the museum can be part of changing the world, where we can respectfully discuss and present topics such as religion, spirituality, and beauty, and explore ways in which these ideas have been expressed in the past according to different cultures and how they are viewed today. Tonight, I would like to welcome our three eminent speakers, Courtney Bender, Anne Broad, and Omid Safi, who have devoted much of their careers thinking, teaching, and writing about issues that intersect with religion and spirituality. And we are in for a special treat to hear from all three of them. Now, a word about the program, the way that we've organized it. Um, they will, I will introduce all three speakers, and then they will each give a presentation with slides for about 10 minutes. And then these three sessions will be followed by a moderated conversation with me. I encourage you to put your comments and questions in the chat section, and I will do my very best to weave them into our conversation, and hopefully we'll also have time for a Q&A uh, session. A couple of technical notes before we start. During today's live program, we are offering real-time captions. To view the simulcast containing these services, please use the link provided in the comment section. If you're viewing this program after the live broadcast, please note that it will also be available on the museum's website and will feature closed captions. Now for our first speaker. Courtney Bender is professor in the Department of Religion at Columbia University. A sociologist and an ethnographer by training, her research and teaching focuses on contemporary American religious life. She is particularly interested in the production and practice of religion in order to better understand religious concepts and ideas in modern social life. Professor Bender is the author of the award-winning The New Metaphysicals, Spirituality and the American Religious Imagination, and Heaven's Kitchen, Living Religion at God's Love We Deliver. This evening, her presentation will focus on the idea of religion and spirituality in relation to museum spaces and their displays of art. Our second speaker is Omid Safi, a leading public intellectual. He is professor of Islamic studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and specializes in contemporary Islamic thought and mysticism. Among his publications is Memories of Muhammad and Radical Love, teaching from the Islamic mystical tradition. Professor Safi is also a frequent commentator on issues related to contemporary Islam. His presentation tonight will be about the appropriation and transformation of Sufism, the mystical tradition of Islam in the United States. And last but not least, our third speaker is Anne Broad, 
She is director of the Women's Studies in Religion program and senior lecturer on American religious history at the Harvard Divinity School, where she has been teaching since 1998. She's also the author of Radical Spirits, Spiritualism and Women's Right in 19th Century America, and Women and American Religion, and has co-edited Root of Bitterness, Documents of the Social History of American Women. Professor Broad will speak to us about the impact of spirituality on the work of two uh, famous modern artists. So may we have um, the first slides for Professor Bender? Okay. Hello, everyone, and thank you. It is really, it's wonderful to be with you this evening. Um, I am a museum goer and lover, as are all of us, I think, who are here this evening. And I imagine that, like you, I um, have been thinking a lot recently about what I am missing about museums. Um, my favorite objects and work of art, certainly, but also the rituals of the museum itself and the experience um, of being in a museum. And so with this in mind, I'd like to think with you this evening, uh, for the next few minutes anyway, about the experience of being in a museum. Why does it sometimes feel spiritual um, for some people and sometimes not? Um, tonight, I want to suggest that um, this feeling of spirituality is not an accident, but in many cases, a design. Um, and so to broad our thinking, I want to offer two examples from the histories of two very well-known museums. And the first, as you see in this first slide that's already up, is um, the example of the Guggenheim Museum in New York City, which is recognizable by this iconic building designed by the architect Frank Lloyd Wright. The next slide, please. Um, the Guggenheim's founding director, you may not know, was a woman, a woman named Hilla Ribe, or Hilla von Ribe, who you see here um, with Frank Lloyd Wright and on her one side and with Solomon Guggenheim on the other. Uh, Ribe worked with Solomon Guggenheim to build his art collection. She was a painter in her own right um, as well. And this collection would be eventually housed in the museum. Now, Ribe was very invested in theosophy about which Professor Brody will say more in a little bit. And she encouraged Guggenheim to collect paintings from painters that she believed embodied the values that she associated with this particular spiritual tradition, um, painters including Kandinsky. Next slide, please. Ribe um, believed in addition to the artworks having some sort of spiritual component that modern museums that housed them could be the institutions that would usher in a spiritual future, a post-religious spiritual future. And you can gather a sort of sense of this in these delightful advertisements that ran in major New York newspapers in the 1930s. She really thought that museums would supplant churches and houses of worship altogether and be their, their next step. So next slide, please. Um, this spiritual mission was a very explicit one. Um, and um, here you see uh, the cover of the first um, Guggenheim Museum um, guidebook. Um, before the Guggenheim was the um, Guggenheim, it was known as the Museum of Non-Objective Painting. And if you go to the first page in the next slide, um, you'll see, next slide, please. That the, and then let's follow on to the next one. Thank you. That you'll see on these first pages that um, the spiritual music, mission of the museum was announced very explicitly here on the first page. Ribe um, also gave lectures on the spirituality of art in the museum nearly every day. Um, so what she thought about the spiritual, in addition to being a theosophist, was that spirituality was experiential and personal, and it connected people to a greater whole. It was universal. It was not sectarian. It was also be beyond words and dogma. So as a consequence, she did not think that spiritual life could be attained by reading or lecturing, even though she did lecture. So if we go to the next slide, please. Ribe thought that people needed to cultivate spirituality through interactions with spiritual artworks. So she designed the museum spaces accordingly. 
She put paintings, as you see here, close to the ground. She added lots of cushy chairs where she expected people to sit for a long time. Um, the walls were dark and she often had Bach playing in these spaces. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. Um, while the longer history of the Guggenheim as a museum is very complex, we actually know that Ribe worked with Wright to build uh, the Fifth Avenue Museum as an experiential temple that would guide people to such a life, um, visitors to such a life um, through the ramps. And it was really her intention explicitly in a way that we might not think is very common today to combine works of art in the proper space so as to actually cultivate spirituality among all visitors. Um, this longer history is not really very well known today, um, and but we might think about the way that it is still visible in the architecture of the museum and also in the collection that the Guggenheim continues to hold. So next, next slide, please. So you might be saying to yourself, well, the Guggenheim is a very special case, and it certainly is. Um, the question you might ask is whether we can think about spirituality at work and display, even in museums that don't have an explicitly spiritual mission like the Guggenheim. So what if we go, for example, a few blocks south along Fifth Avenue in New York City to New York City's Museum of Modern Art? This museum um, opened in 1929. Here you see the 1939 building. Um, and there were many, many people who were involved in the um, opening of the Museum of Modern Art. Um, but it really wouldn't have happened without the ideas and the funding and the organizing prowess of two people who we see on the next slide. Um, they are um, Abby Aldrich Rockefeller, um, the wife of John Rockefeller Jr. and also its first executive director, the art historian Alfred Barr. Now, the MoMA is in no way like the Guggenheim. And in fact, its um, founders and its first ex um, directors uh, actively rejected the kinds of spiritual approaches that Ribe championed. Nonetheless, the museum's leaders also operated with an implicit distinction between religion and spirituality that had consequences for things that happened in the museum. Now, the distinction of religion and spirituality that was familiar in the, in the MoMA um, was familiar also to liberal Protestants in the 1920s. And Mrs. Rockefeller, as a liberal Protestant, was informed by these understandings. In the 1920s, she was collecting both modern art and um, Asian art and antiquities, um, as we'll see in the next um, slide. Um, she um, was just um, collecting all kinds of beautiful things in the 1920s. And these ideas of spirituality and religion were circulating. So thinking about her, um, her Asian collection in particular, um, she loved, she wrote many letters talking about how much she adored her Buddhist artworks that she, and antiquities that she was collecting. These two that you see are now part of the Metropolitan Museum's collection. Um, in fact, Rockefeller installed in her houses, she had many houses, she installed Buddha rooms and um, in her um, house in Seal Harbor in Maine, she also installed an Asian garden, which we'll see in the next slide, um, where she arranged it both in the rooms and in this garden, she arranged religious artifacts and objects as she had seen them in temples during her travels through Asia. Now, we also know from Mrs. Rockefeller's letters that she bought books about Buddhism in order to try to learn about her artworks and their meanings. Um, and she told her, her friends and she told her sister and she even spoke in public about how Buddhism really left her cold as a religion. She thought it left a lot to be desired. Yet in the same breath, she would say and reiterate again and again, and I'll quote here, Buddhistic art is the most inspiring and spiritual. So spirituality we hear is a sort of toggle switch for her. Um, she could embrace um, the spiritual, uh, these objects as spiritual, but not as religious. Um, we might say that the language of the spiritual and the experience perhaps allowed her to connect with the beauty or the universal, which she understood to be the universal in an object that was otherwise foreign to her. Um, so from this, we might actually ask two further questions. How did she see the spiritual? And what was the consequence to the objects or the artifacts? There are a lot of ways we can take this, but I wanna just sort of close with um, uh, an anecdote um, that is telling, I think, from Alfred Barr, um, the other figure I told you, the executive director. So early on in the MoMA's history, he um, was asked to um, write an essay about a 
display of Russian icons that was at the Metropolitan Museum. Um, and if you go to the next slide, please. And um, he wrote an essay about these objects and he falls in love with these objects that are on display. And he says some very interesting things that I think are telling to us about this language and this shift between religion and spirituality. So the first thing that he does is that he praises the Soviets for removing the icons from their church homes. He charges, in fact, the, he charges the Russian Orthodox Church with damaging the, their beauty and subjecting them to smoke and incense and other things that are involved with worship. And he argues um, that their worth and their value, their beauty, even their spirituality is better preserved by the conservator, the atheist conservator, than it is by the faithful. And then he says something that's even more interesting, I think, it may be more surprising to our ears, and he says this, and I'll quote, this is a quote of Alfred Barr from 1931. Whatever one's religious beliefs, he says, it can scarcely be denied that the Russian church often worked for evil. It encouraged superstition of the most primitive order. Icons were worshipped almost as fetishes and employed for all matter of magical as well as devotional purposes. That's an end quote. So, Barr is actually saying something I think that's quite similar to Mrs. Rockefeller. She is disconnecting the religious and the spiritual, and so is he. She is privileging what she thinks is the universal spiritual and the works of art, and so is he. And move to the next slide, please. So at MoMA, a Mr. Barr would make museum displays and exhibits that would allow viewers to see the distinction of the universal and the particular as crucial to experiencing artworks. And this involved displacing materials not only from their contexts, but also orienting viewers towards what he understood to be the universal and not towards something that was specific or historical or political or even religious. So many historians have noted that the MoMA's display practices, including displaying arts of work on white walls, like we see here, um, with space far enough between objects so that visitors and the works of art were isolated from other things in the room, um, created very distinctive sets of interactions with artworks. Um, we can move to the next slide, please. Um, you know, such a, an approach actually sounds a lot different from rebase at the Guggenheim, but I think it similarly took for granted or takes for, took for granted that the museum goer was already the possessor of something called spirit, a spiritual vision, um, and that this display technique would allow her to see the beauty and the universality of an artwork and to distinguish that aspect of an artwork from its religious or political or historical life, or even other ways that it could be seen and understood. It was the former, the spiritual, that was more important and, it, and enabled radically different works of art to be viewed in the same space and in the same way. I think that this is a less explicit idea of spirituality than rebase, but also no less pow powerful. So next slide, please. I just wanna ask then here at the, at the end of my time, um, how we think these historical examples that seem so foreign to us perhaps, um, help us think about how we encounter spirituality in the museum today. I actually have some ideas about this and I hope we might have a chance to discuss them, but now I'm going to turn this over to the next um, person. I think Omid, you are next up. Thank you for your time. Hello, I'm delighted to be joining um, the colleagues from the Sackler and the Freer Gallery, as well as our audience members in having a discussion about the way that uh, the holdings of Islamic art help us think through issues of what are sometimes labeled religion and spirituality. And uh, for the purpose of our conversation, I want to be focusing on two of the most important, most influential, most widely circulated examples of Islamic art and literature, namely the extraordinary mystical poetry of Hafiz and Rumi. So I want to uh, share with you some images from these two extraordinary uh, poets. 
And we're going to begin by taking a look at the shrine of Hafez uh, in the beautiful city of Shiraz in Iran, which is, as you can tell, a pilgrimage center. It's a place that people come to and have been coming to for over 600 years. So this is a living tradition. These are not relics of the past. There is a living community who continues to read and recite and chant this poetry. It shapes the music of ordinary lives. And there's an interpretive community that is involved that we want to always remember and highlight. So here are some extraordinary examples that we have of the divan -e hafez the poetry of Hafez, as it has been illuminated. Um, you'll notice that the style of the artwork is reminiscent of the illumination of the Quran itself. Um, this is perhaps not surprising, particularly in the case of Hafez, whose name, after all, means someone who has memorized the Quran, a Hafez, is someone who has committed the Quran to the heart. So right off the bat, we have the case of a mystical poet whose poetry is at once religious and erotic and mystical and sensual and filled with intoxication poetry. And perhaps more than any other poet, it is characterized by that unambiguous quality of ambiguity. Hafez's poetry can be read as earthly erotic wine poetry, and it has, and it continues to be, and it can be read as the most sublime of mystical poetry in praise of God and the saints and the prophet, and it has, and what is so distinctive about it is the way that it can shift register in such a subtle way. So if we have somehow come to relegate religion to otherworldly concerns, detached and divorced and removed from this worldly pleasures and delights, Hafez is going to frustrate that attempt. Likewise, in the beautiful ways in which the poetry of Hafez has been illustrated so here you see um, a wonderful scene of a royal scene of a king figure seated on, uh, on a carpet. Um, there is perhaps a drink that is being served. There are female musicians in the lower left playing the harp and a frame drum. And on the top left, you see uh, a poem from Hafez that even the rose without the face of the beloved would not be lovely. And without wine, without wine, spring itself would bring no pleasure, no joy. Now, as to what this wine refers to and who this beloved is, that is the ambiguity of Hafez's poetry. So there might be some conservative Muslim friends visiting um, the Sackler and the Freer who would see such a poetry, they would have no problems with looking at um, illuminated manuscripts of the Quran. But if they were to see something like Hafez's illuminated poetry illustrated like this with dancing girls, with wine poetry being labeled as Islamic, well, they might raise an eyebrow because it is actually challenging them to expand their understanding of what constitutes Islam. How wide and expansive is this universe of Islam? Here's another wonderful scene that you see. This one is a scene of a Sama ceremony, a mystical gathering of music and dance, uh, of rising above mere rational discourse. And here's a close-up image that we see. Uh, and you see that the dervishes are ecstatic. One of them on the lower right-hand side is ripping his shirt because the intensity of the joyous experience is too much for him to bear. Um, and again, if music and dance 
and ecstasy and whirling, which were all a part of mystical life and communal life in the medieval and the modern Muslim tradition, uh, were something that some audience members are not familiar with, it could get them puzzled and perplexed. So the real question that I want us to be considering is not, is Hafez's poetry Islamic? I want us to actually switch that question around and say, when we speak of Hafez and Rumi as being examples of Islamic art, can we start with a capacious and generous understanding of Islam that would already include the erotic and the sensual and the embodied and the musical and the physical and the transformative. We're going to notice something quite extraordinary if we move from the Sackler and the Freer to your local bookstores and you're going to see copies of poetry attributed to Hafez that have literally nothing to do with anything that the earthly historical poet Hafez ever said. These are some of the best-selling books that are attributed to Hafez, but they're entirely made up by an American poet, passing his own poetry under Hafez's name. So the question of cultural appropriation is quite on point here. And if you were to um, look around the Facebook and Instagram, almost every single quote that is attributed to Hafez is in fact fake. It's something that the earthly historical Persian poet Hafez of Shiraz never said. Which brings us to the example of Molana Rumi. Rumi, who one of the most influential Muslims who has ever lived, who has had such an impact on Iran, on Turkey, on Central Asia, and on South Asia. Uh, Rumi, who uh, called himself the offspring of the soul of the prophet. And Rumi, who calls his own masterpiece the unveiler of the Quran. The unveiler of the Quran. So what happens to this reception of Rumi. By the way, take a look at a beautiful manuscript of the first pages of the Masnavi, Rumi's masterpiece that is held in the Sackler, right? The Bishno as ne chun hikoyat mi konat page. Well, in an American context, Rumi's poetry is going to be by and large detached from Islam and read as a kind of universalist poetry. I am neither Christian, nor Muslim, nor Jewish, nor Magian, nor anything, that I am simply from that timeless, eternal place. The problem is, of course, that Rumi himself never said anything quite like this. Rumi, for Rumi, who was, of course, deeply spiritual, deeply mystical, his mysticism his spiritual practice was deeply grounded in his Islamic identity and his Islamic practice. So the real question that we want to ask is, are we conceiving of spirituality as something that can only take place by erasing and negating the particularity of different religious traditions especially when those religious traditions happen to come from outside the purview of the West. What happens to ritual? What happens to scripture? What happens to institutions? And what happens to community in our rush to move towards this understanding of spirituality? I'm going to end this conversation with one little reminder um, of these passages that we see. Uh, Let the beauty we love be what we do. There are a thousand ways to kneel and kiss the ground. A common and beloved poem that is circulated, attributed to Rumi. And for us to remember that in Rumi's original Persian, when he says, um, thousand ways to kneel and kiss the ground. The original actually said, Sadgunin namaz asto, roku asto, sajud. 
what he's referring to is not kneeling and kissing the ground in some abstract way. He is specifically naming the bodily postures of the five times a day prescribed prayers for Muslims. In other words, Rumi is kneeling and kissing the ground can only be read in light of the very religious practice that he himself, like all of his own community, were engaged in. So part of what we want to do in our art museums in welcoming friends and audience members to this community um, and to these exhibitions is to figure out how do we highlight and share this beautiful spiritual offering that indeed has something to say to the whole of humanity while also preserving the distinct particularity and the roots of the religious traditions that have come to nurture these particular traditions. Um, shameless plug, that's exactly what I try to do in one of my own courses called Illuminated Courses, which are open to everybody. Um, so I think I will stop there. And if we have some more time in the q and I'd love to come back and talk about ways that examples of Islamic art, such as this Chinese-inspired piece of the Quran, can help us rethink the question of where Islamic art actually is. Thank you so much for your time. Good evening. I'm Ann Browdy, and I'm very pleased to greet you from the Green Mountains of Vermont. I wish that we all could be at the museum, uh, which is where we had hoped this would take place. Uh, and I want to give very hearty thanks to the very determined staff of the Freer and Sackler Galleries, um, who persevered with this event through some very difficult transitions. I first visited the Freer Gallery of Asian art in the 1970s with my 75-year-old Jewish grandmother, the painter Vicki Sperry, by far the most spiritual member of our family. Vicki had shocked my parents in the 1950s by becoming a Christian scientist, and she aggravated them even further by treating her grandchildren to incessant talk of spirituality, accompanied by delightfully gooey chocolate cake ensuring that we would treasure every gem that fell from her lips, as well as the art that surrounded us in her home. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, here are a few of the treasures from my grandmother's house that now sit atop the piano in my living room. Um, she collected some of these while traveling in Asia in the 1950s and acquired others from dealers in the 1960s. Um, but she actually had very little interest in the Asian-ness of Asian art, just as Omid has suggested. Um, she valued these figures because they evoked in her a sense of stillness and tranquility, the same qualities she experienced when she viewed paintings by Rembrandt or Cezanne, the same qualities she viewed as hallmarks of great art and aspired to communicate in her own painting. Next slide, please. Uh, you see, Vicki Sperry was an abstract expressionist painter. And there you can see uh, her painting over the piano um, with the Buddhas in the foreground. Uh, like all other abstract expressionists, Vicki hoped to evoke feelings in her viewers. But unlike other New York School artists, the feelings she hoped to evoke were exclusively positive in keeping with her Christian science faith. Today, I want to look at the way that artists understand spirituality and the role it plays in artistic production. I want to suggest a few possible vectors connecting modern artists in the West to the art and spiritualities of Asia. For it may seem at first that there is very little connecting a painting like Sperry's Orange Grove Number no. 3, which you see here, to the statues of the Buddha and of Shiva that she treasured. 
I'd like to suggest instead that much connects them and that the deeper we look into modern art, the more relevant Asian religions will become. Next slide, please. From the early days of abstraction, modern painters appealed to Asian religions because they affirmed the transience and malleability of the material world. Vasily Kandinsky, who considered himself to be the first abstract artist, articulated this view in his 1911 book concerning the spiritual in art. There he described modern art as an expression of internal feelings, quote, renouncing all consideration of external form. To support this view, he appealed to the primary source from which European and American artists learned about religions of India and East Asia, the theosophical writings of Helena Blavatsky. And uh, I know theosophy sounds like a strange word. It's really, uh, for our purposes, it was the way that Westerners got access to Asian, to a somewhat digested version of Asian religions. Uh, what I'd like to do today uh, in these few minutes is to explore the work of two modern artists who were deeply influenced by Asian religious ideas filtered through theosophy, both of whom have been the subject of recent highly acclaimed exhibitions. The Swedish painter Hilma F. Klint and the Boston painter Hyman Bloom, a Jewish immigrant from Latvia. Like many abstract painters, they found in Asian religi religious ideas a liberation from the material world as the subject of art. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, and there they are, uh, Hilma and Hyman, uh, two rather different painters. But I find them both relevant to today's discussion, because, both because of the role of spirituality in their work, which was fundamental, and because of the role of spirituality in the reception of their work. In both cases, the artist's attempt to convey spiritual reality made their work either un incomprehensible to their contemporaries. In the case of F. Clint, whose work was um, slept unseen for many, many decades because it made no sense in, in, its, in the time it was painted. Um, or spirituality made their work controversial in the case of Bloom at the time it was created. And much of that controversy um, centered around his painting of the corpse of the dead body and whether that could be a subject of art or was simply too grotesque and too disturbing to be displayed in an art museum. In both cases, 21st century curators and audiences, in contrast to their 20th century counterparts, have embraced the spirituality of these artists' work and seen it as essential to the work's artistic contribution. So first, let's turn to Hilma F. Clint, whose rediscovered work has caused a sensation in the art world. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and if we were in person, I would ask you to raise your hands and tell me who is familiar with F. Clint's work and that would shape my presentation, but we can't do that. So um, I wish I could communicate with you more directly. Um, but what I can tell you about F. Clint very quickly is that she was an academically trained painter. Um, an 1887 graduate of the Swedish Royal Academy, known for landscapes and portraits, as well as botanical illustrations. And then something happened. Next slide, please. What happened was entirely spiritual. Uh, what happened between the seascape and these unprecedented modern works the artistic breakthrough resulted from F. Clint's decision that spiritual rather than material reality should guide her work. After several years of spiritual investigation, she accepted a commission from a spirit who spoke to her in weekly seance circles, a voice she understood to be the spirit of a Tibetan spiritual master. The commission required the 43-year-old F. Clint to abandon her livelihood as a realistic painter, to spend a year fasting, praying, and purifying herself, 
to complete a set of spiritual paintings that would ultimately number in the hundreds. And at the end of that year of preparation and discipline, while in trance, with the spirit guiding her hand, she painted these 10 paintings over a six week period, which is exhausting just to think about that. She knew that the spirits intended the paintings to communicate spiritual knowledge, not just to her, but to humankind. She knew that they depicted the unseen reality that theosophists saw as the basis for all religions. They depicted, as Helena Blavatsky put it, quote, the dual nature of every object on earth in the spiritual and the material, the visible and the invisible nature. But what exactly these paintings communicated, Hilma did not know. Slide eight, please. Uh, the next slide, thank you. Uh, some of the symbols in the paintings Hilma could recognize from Blavatsky's book, The Secret Doctrine. There, for example, the egg, a frequent symbol in these paintings, which are called the 10 largest, uh, received an entire chapter. According to the secret doctrine, the egg was, quote, a universal symbol incorporated as a sacred sign in the cosmogony of every people on earth. In Sanskrit scripture, Blavatsky wrote, the egg represented the, quote, ever existing undifferentiated matter that precedes creation. It symbolized the primordial unity out of which forms emerged when spirit separated from matter to give shape to the material world. Or the egg could represent the auric egg, the envelope which surrounds the individual carrying their karmic inheritance from one life to the next through the process of reincarnation. Another recurrent symbol, the lotus blossom, Blavatsky also described as universal. It represented the abstract and the concrete universes, the productive powers of both spiritual and physical nature. Now, if we have time later, we can talk more about the symbolism in Afklint's work, which we could talk about all day and all night, and we still wouldn't be sure exactly what was going on. But in our brief time tonight, we're going to move on to our second example, Hyman Bloom. Next slide, please. Like F. Clint, as you can see here, Hyman Bloom was academically trained. And like F. Clint, something happened after that. Next slide, please. Something very different happened. Something spiritual happened. Jackson Pollock and Willem de Kooning called Bloom the first abstract expressionist, having seen his work at the Museum of Modern Art in 1942 but the label did not stick. Next slide, please. Uh, this is one of the paintings that they saw at the Modern in 1942. It's called The Bride. And I believe that this reclining figure is among the first of Bloom's paintings of corpses. Um, you can see the bride's head on the far light right as she uh, reclines in repose. Uh, next slide, please. Following a mystical experience that convinced him of the beauty of all things, Hyman Bloom began painting corpses, often in the course of an autopsy. And for me, it's impossible to look at these works without reference to the Buddhist practice of meditating on death and on the decay of the body. The body is very beautiful, Bloom said, when his corpse paintings were criticized and its insides are just as beautiful as its outsides. Now, I find this particular painting, which is called The Hull, um, particularly provocative because when I look at it, I can almost get that Grandma Vicky sense of peace and repose in the depiction of the corpse. But then there is that upright knife and the hands wielding the knife to dismember the body so that we are invited simultaneously to experience the revulsion of the one who cuts and the eternal rest of the one now immune to the violence of the knife. Next slide, please. 
Um, here is one of Bloom's more representational works. Um, and it's, it's quite interesting to note that the corpse uh, images and these more representational pictures um, occur simultaneously. They weren't different phases. They were uh, two continuing threads in his oeuvre. Um, and these more representational works often depict moments of ecstatic transcendence. And it would be lovely to compare this image to the, uh, the one of Rumi that we, we saw. Um, moments when human beings experience the permeability of the boundaries of the self that characterize the mystical experience. In this image of a crowded synagogue on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, a cantor brings the congregation to that boundary of permeabil permeability, intoning the dramatical Nidra prayer, understood in Judaism to mark the opening of the gates of heaven to all who atone, regardless of their inevitable shortcomings during the past year. Next slide, please. Uh, and here is another image of permeability on the left. Uh, you see a spirit medium surrounded by the spirits for whom she serves as a vehicle of communication between the living and the dead. And like F. Clint, Bloom also sat in seances as well as exploring uh, theosophy. I'm indebted to the wonderful Hyman Bloom scholar, Marsha Brennan, for drawing our attention to the similarity between the figure of the medium and this statue of Guan Yin, the bod Bodhisattva of Compassion, uh, which we also saw in um, the Rockefeller's Garden. She noted Bloom's deep familiarity with the Asian art collections at Boston's Museum of Fine Arts, where this uh, statue resides and where he must have been familiar with it. Um, that's all the time I have. I hope these examples provide some grist for our discussion of spirituality and the art museum by introducing you to artists for whom modern art and spirituality are inseparable. These artists definitely saw art as universal, but their understanding of universality was quite different from that of the collectors and quite different from those who would universalize art in order to commercialize it. Thank you. Thank you to our uh, three speakers. I, I, I'm sure everybody agrees that you have given us a lot to think about. I'm not sure if we're going to have time to um, answer all the, uh, or respond to all the sort of ideas that you raised, but thank you for absolutely wonderful presentations. Um, all three of you spoke um, very much about different aspects of spirituality. And even though religion kept coming in and out of the presentations, it was mostly spirituality that you focused on. And I was wondering um, if you could talk, maybe all three of you very briefly about religion. I don't wanna say versus spirituality, but, but religion and then spirituality, especially in today's American landscape. Um, I think, um, I mean, as, as an art museum, we not only deal with objects of the past, but I think one of our um, responsibilities is to sort of connect it to the present. So I'm really um, curious to get your thoughts on um, religion and spirituality in the American landscape today. I know it's a broad uh, question, but if you could, um, respond briefly, I would be very grateful. I, I might just say that one of the things that we know as sociologists, well, as I know as a sociologist, but scholars of religion also know is that um, uh, fewer and fewer Americans over the last 20 years have say that they are religious and more and more say that they are not anything. Um, and it's about 20 to 25% of the US population and many of the people within that pot of people who say that they're not any religion will nonetheless say that they're spiritual, right? So that, and what they mean by that is unclear. It could be actually very many things. And it also should be said that most of the people who say that they're religious 
also say that they're spiritual, right? So, so um, yeah, I think that when we're often talking about spirituality in the context of museums, I'd love to know what Anne and Omid have to say about this, that we're talking about um, people who have exited religion or who have never been connected to a religious community. Um, and they imagine themselves or find themselves in a place where um, they still are thinking about issues of ultimate concern. They might have uh, feelings or expressions or even communities that they don't think about as being religious, where they have some kind of connection. And so um, part of what we're talking about in spirituality are types and forms of ways of seeking meaning, either individually or collectively, um, that, um, that don't track with, with what we understand religion to be. But I'll just say, and I'll pitch it to someone else, that what we don't understand religion to be can sometimes be something like theosophy or something like um, you know, spiritual practices that have their own long traditions, right? So that they're not necessarily like new and the person has discovered them or made them, but they, they might have their own long, very long and estimable histories of understandings of the transcendent mm -hmm. or however you want to put it. So that's my two cents, three cents, I guess. Okay. <laughs> Professor Safi or, or Professor Brody, would you like to comment or should we? Uh, I can certainly chime in. Um, uh, religion and spirituality are dicey terms. Um, religion is usually understood as related to an institution, whereas spirituality is more uh, related to the individual ex experience. Um, frequently one's religion is the thing that your parents forced you to learn and spirituality is the thing that you found yourself. And um, that it often, what seems spiritual in somebody else's religion is that you discovered it as an adult and that it's exotic and that your parent, it's not related to parental authority. Um, whereas if you experienced the religion you were born in, in an adult way, you would find just as much mysticism and spirituality there as if you go to the Asian art museum and um, look at a different religion. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Oh, me? You, mean you, 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 you mute it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, I think the only thing that I would add would be that this very notion that spirituality consists of an individual quest for the ineffable, for the transcendent, uh, in a way that is somehow detached and separate from one's own ancestral, uh, cultural, religious tradition, there is something that to my distinctly non-Western eyes and ears strikes me as very particularly modern and very particularly Western, and perhaps as a cause of concern, particularly open to the great God of our world, which is the marketplace. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you want to claim that you're spiritual, there's somebody that has made a product to mm -hmm. sell that to you. Um, and when I study the world of medieval mystics, one of the things that I find is that for them, the notion of religion and spiritual or mystical, whatever term you want to put on it, that these were not separate spheres. And they would have talked about wanting to go to the heart of the matter. Mm -hmm. So the question for them was not whether does one pray? It was when you're praying, can you pray as if you see the face of God? instead of it being a simple mechanical gymnastics. Uh, and I would love to keep that sense of a much more fluid, interpenetrating connection between the spiritual and the religious, at least as a possibility. Mm -hmm. well, well, that makes me actually think of um, my next question that, that um, is about Rumi, but, but I feel what has been happening with with um, with Rumi has also has had precedence um, before, but as as you as you so um, eloquently uh, illustrated, is that um, Rumi has been stripped of all, of, at least his poetry has been stripped of his um, of his 
Islamic or, or, or spiritual, not spiritual, but, but the Muslim, the Islamic spiritual meaning. Um, and he's been presented as a sort of new age guru. But at the same time, um, having become a new age guru, he's become a household word. So this is something that as a museum, we have to deal with it you know, at all times. So how do you recognize the, the historical Rumi, as you just mentioned before, sort of pre-commodification and the new age Rumi? And for that matter, I mean, and, and I think it really cuts across other Asian religions as well, um, for instance, or for instance, the, the um, Indic yogic tradition mm -hmm and current global yoga practices. We, for instance, had an exhibition on yoga and our audiences were disappointed because they expected to come and learn new poses in the exhibition rather than the roots of, of this you know, incredibly rich tradition. So how can we, you know, how can we reconcile these these polls, not only as as curators, but I assume maybe as as you know academics, you you also deal with similar sort of polarization or binaries. It's true, and I think what I find particularly boring uh, is to engage in an exercise of, if you would, the quest for the historical Rumi. Mm -hmm. Right. That's no more imaginative than the quest for the historical Jesus or the quest for the historical Muhammad. In some ways, what I find so much more interesting is how have people over the passage of time and place come to engage these particular teachings and the figures that they associate as having embodied them. So indeed, there is or there are multiple Iranian receptions of Rumi which turn him into a kind of Shia type figure. There are contemporary Turkish receptions of Rumi, which make him into a secular humanist. Um, and there are now these American receptions, which as you say, make him into a kind of new age figure. I think the point that I would love to see us not lose sight of is that of community. Who have been the people who have based their life on these teachings, who've been the ones who have sang these songs, recited these poems, danced to them, have had Qawwali sessions to them. Uh, I want to make sure that we're not losing sight of the interpretive community that has engaged this tradition. And that's perhaps one way of avoiding what I see as the pitfall, which is deliberately erasing and eradicating all of the more than thousand references that Rumi has for example, to the verses of the Quran. So that's exactly what's happening in America when the people doing the so-called versions, they say, well, you know, I don't really care much about God and love uh, in that Islamic tradition. I just want to talk about love in the abstract universal tradition. Um, where is it said that this new age tradition is the only one that can speak universally? I actually think all of our traditions have something to offer all of us, but through their particularity, not being erased and eradicated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do either of you have um, comments, thoughts, whether it's about, not necessarily about Islam, but, but about other religious traditions? And it's really about um, wh whose voice matters. And this is something that in the, um, I know that in the museum we we deal with and um i'm sure it, it's also a an issue in the you know in the academia so so i mean i i um i agree with with what um professor professor safi says about you know the there isn't one historical moment to go back to there's no you know but but um i mean in a museum we have 75 words uh, for a label, mm -hmm. and um, so how do you, how do you get at that? And I think you know in 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 a um, uh, in a class, I mean you can only spend I don't know how many how many uh, <laughs> classes on on a certain figure. So um, I, I'm just curious how how, um, how how you tackle it. We haven't figured it out in the museum, but I'm wondering how it's tackled in in the academia about 
about the voices? Well, I, if I can say, I think one thing that is striking, I'm, I'm thinking about, about what um, both of my colleagues have been saying, is that there's a, um, so if we think about, um, one of the things about the sort of claim of universality of the spiritual is that it is very flattening, not mm -hmm. just, so it's not just like, oh, we should bring the history back in, but we should say like, well, what are, so what I, what I think is that, you know, there is, there is, we sort of have in the museum or even in a classroom sort of one way of looking at an object, right? You're so like, there's one way of understanding, but within religious communities, objects, artifacts, materials actually have highly variegated and sometimes incredibly like astonishingly, um, well, I'll just say unusual, but like so different from us ideas about like what those objects actually can do, mm -hmm. right? What they can, how they communicate. Um, they have agency, they have power, they have, um, they demand a different kind of relationship between communities or individuals and the object than what is actually sort of normal within a classroom or certainly within a museum, right? So bringing the historical sort of frame of an object or understanding of an object is one way to sort of start to think about that multiplicity of ways that humans actually inter interact with objects, right? But, you know, when um, when a bodhisattva, when a, when a Buddha is in a building, it, you know, what, you know, is it consecrated? Does it actually have the power to move people? Um, I mean, I, so there you start getting at the sort of live wire, whether you're in a, in a classroom or in a museum, right? And you really are thinking about power, right? And there is a certain power to the way that we think about spirituality now, which gives very little power to the objects and, um, or concedes very little power to the objects. And, um, you know, but that's only one way of, of doing things. And I think as scholars, right, at me as a scholar, I will say, I find this very fraught myself, right? Because I don't want, you know, I'm teaching about these things. We're trying to teach these things. We're not trying to do them. But the objects I think also are sort of pulling us in their histories and in the communities that engage them into a different kind of relationship sometimes with them. So that's, I think the, um, I think this is what you are gesturing towards, Omid, when you're you're thinking about. I mean, so so that, and I think that's a really a big question, and I don't know if I have any answers to that either. But I think about it a lot. <laughs> um, I'm looking. I'm looking in the chat. Um, I don't want to just come up with questions that I want to ask or our staff have have proposed. Um, there is a question for Anne. Did um, Bloom actually reference Buddhism in his paintings mm. of the open corpses? Mm. Um, not that I know of. Um, Bloom, mm. um, his uh, Bloom is just an absolutely fascinating figure with a wonderful kind of innocence about him. He was very devoted to Indian music. I showed the a uh, photograph of him playing the sitar. He taught himself to play the sitar in the 1940s. He found some mm -hmm. uh, photograph records by Ravi Shankar's father. And um, it's clearly was he, he had that sense of the meditative um, connection. So he was very, very involved with Indian music uh, more than with texts. So um, I'm not, I, and, and I'm not a Bloom scholar. I was really offering these as examples to advance our discussion of art and spirituality. Um, uh, so I, 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 I can't say whether, um, uh, whether he was thinking of that. Um, there is, um, one question for, I guess, for, for, um, for everyone, and uh, it's a question comment. Why do we still use the term Western? Um, that is 18, 19th, 19th century trope so long bypassed. <laughs> Did I use it? I'm, I, <laughs> you know, old habits die hard, but um, yeah, I, I definitely didn't use the term Eastern. I, I don't think those terms are helpful. And what I was really trying to uh, show is the degree of interaction um, between these four, these 
um, cultures and ideas, sets of ideas that have been viewed as being so geographically and politically separated. I would tend to agree. I mean, sometimes we fall back on shorthands, but how ironic it is that, um, you know, the Jewish and Christian tradition, which flourish in, um, you know, historic Palestine and, and nearby regions, we relegate that as the origin of something called Western. And Muhammad, who grows up in Arabia, not all that far away, uh, we relegate that to something called uh, Eastern. And um, if the other basis of what we think of as, as Western is the great tradition of philosophy, then at least for a good 700 years, uh, the primary interpreters and commentators on the Greek philosophical tradition were all writing in Arabic, regardless of their faith, and most of them were Muslim. So these are, in some ways, it tells us a lot about 18th and 19th century. They don't shine a lot of light on any of the traditions that, that we're talking about. Um, but almost any term that we use, we can always scrutinize uh, that to the nth degree. Maybe it's just a polite way of saying empire <laughs> or um, um, Christianity. Um, I think sometimes sort of like, an, you know, not Christianity as a living tradition, but sort of as attached to certain kinds of histories and, and empires. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think it's a shorthand um, that, and I agree, it's not particularly precise, yeah. but it often sometimes is just a polite word. Um, I'm I'm looking at the um, at the clock, but I had one um, question to ask you, and um, that came from one of our staff members. How can we reconcile encouraging a deeper understanding of religion and spirituality in an age when religion is used? Uh, more and more as a political tool. And um, the Hagia Sophia transformation into a mosque, mm -hmm. um, building a Hindu temple over a mosque site, which apparently is being uh, streamed today in New York in Times Square. Um, and again, as, um, as a museum, as place, places for contemplation and spirituality. I think, I don't know if you have any guidance um, for us of, of how to, how to um, do it in an in a age where more and more religion has been politicized. It would be, we would be very grateful. You know, I'll start the, the conversation. So first of all, I would say it's not so much that religion is being politicized. Religion has always been. Always been social and political and communal and ritual and institutional. What is happening today, we got to name it, is we have the coupling of a particularly mean-spirited and nasty interpretation of religion being linked to fervent and at times racially charged understandings of nationalism. So in the US, it's white nationalism being linked to a particular understanding of Christianity, the same kind of a phenomena taking place in the Jewish, the Islamic, the Christian. And we all thought and hoped that our Buddhist friends would be immune to this somehow until you see what's happening in Myanmar. The only reminder that I would love to have us, Omid means hope, and I have to get up on the side of hope every day, um, is while it's true that there's a whole heck of a lot of ugliness and meanness and violence that's being done justified by religion. Without religion, we wouldn't have had the civil rights movement. We wouldn't have had Gandhi. We wouldn't have had Rumi. We wouldn't have had Nelson Mandela. We wouldn't have had a lot of figures, um, Rabbi Heschel, people whose life has been illuminated through their particular faith traditions. And that individual faith has transformed into a mass movement for justice, not only for their own people, but for the betterment of humanity. So I want us to keep that possibility alive, that the hope is not necessarily by curtailing and exiling and restricting religion. It's the question of what kind of religion in whose interest and what other ideologies is it being linked to? 
If I can respond to this question as well, of course I would agree with Omid that religion has always been political. Um, but one of the things that I think is most problematic about the political versions of religions is that they try to exclude other participants in the same religion from legitimately identifying as part of that faith. And I think an important role for the museum is to portray the internal diversity of every religion. Um, and um, you mentioned that some people were upset by the yoga exhibit because it wasn't what they were expecting. I have to say, Masuma, that in the classroom, we view that as something positive if we uh, <laughs> challenge people's expectations and um, if they leave with a different perspective than they entered. I know that you are in a slightly different um, uh, relationship to the participant. You know, we're grading them and you don't get to give the museum goers a grade, although that could be interesting. Um, <laughs> They give us a great exactly, sorry. exactly. <laughs> yeah, but um, but I do think that uh, for the museum to be a place uh, that can give accurate information about the internal diversity of every religious faith is an enormous service. So, if I can just add on a, a comment as well, I I take a lot of um, I am so um, completely gobsmacked at what I see um, peers doing in museums um, uh, where there's actually contention over collections. And the ways that I see some museums being sites of reconciliation, where, for example, Native American objects that are held in collections that are about where there's a dispute over provenance, or where there are other kinds of disputes that involve museum collections, actually, and often around like religious or spiritual issues. Um, I think that there's a growing um, set of practices and tools and um, responses and programs that where museums are taking on a very active role in thinking about um, what they can do to build reconciliation in communities where there has been tension, where there has been um, hatred um, and where these are like really real things, like they're about people's sacred things, right? And they're very different ideas about what is important in life. And so, um, although, so I think there's, a, there's actually a possibility for even a slight extension, if not transformation of what a museum can do, a museum that holds collections, that holds religious collections or religious objects um, to these spaces where different kinds of communities can come together that have different stakes in, the ish, in, in materials, not always come to an agreement, but at least talk to each other and learn from each other. And I think that we actually are in desperate need of, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a person who thinks that like talking can get us to a better place, right? But we certainly need to be able to um, at least begin to think about what that means. And I actually think museums are phenomenal places for that to happen. Um, so I would encourage all museums to think about how they can participate in that in some way. Well, um, on that positive note, uh, um, I'm, 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 I'm delighted to, um, I'm, I'm not delighted to end this conversation, but I'm, I'm glad that we ended on a positive note. Um, and um, I know that we've gone over our allotted time, but I really wanted to take the opportunity to thank our three speakers, and Brody, um, Courtney Bender, and Omid Safi for joining us. Um, I also want to thank um, all of you who've joined us from home. Um, this was the third of our conversations in this series, and you can access the recordings of all three at youtube.com slash Freya and the Sackler. Now, we have one last treat for, a treat for you in September, which is a four-part series on Sufi devotional music. And for that, we go to Morocco, we go to Iran, we go to India, and we go to Spain. So it's a very special program, and you can find more details about it on our website, um, asia.si.edu slash event um, for the specific dates. And I hope you will join us then. Um, our thanks again to the Lilly Endowment for making these programs
possible and to all of you for being here and please stay safe. Thank you.